This is the Business of Biotech, Summer Executive Sessions Edition. I'm Matt Piller, Chief Editor at Bioprocess Online, and we've got a great show lined up for you today. My guest today is a problem solver named Dr. Paul Watton. He's CEO at Obsidian Therapeutics. Uh, Obsidian is a cell and gene therapy company, and it represents Dr. Watton's fourth CEO appointment. Uh, he previously held that responsibility at o Okada and Terez and Topogen after running point on business development at Sky Pharma, Urand, and Penwest. And if I mispronounced any of those, I'll invite Dr. Watton to correct me here shortly. Uh, before all that, uh, Dr. Watton was a project manager and section head at Abbott, and way back when, uh, development pharmacist at Merck. Dr. Watton, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. Pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to have you. Did I mis mispronounce any of your uh, your previous companies? Uh, not so far. <laughs> although although uh, I did actually um, start Sigalon up with Bob Lang and the guys from Flagship a few years back. I was CEO of that, so I'm probably on five now. Oh, okay. My bad. I missed that. I apologize. <laughs> uh, needless to say, plenty of CEO level experience. And on today's episode, uh, we're going to have a very interesting conversation that will give our listeners some insight into why I characterize Dr. Watton as a problem solver. Uh, we're going to dive into Dr. Watton's solution to a COVID-19 induced problem that uh, you all, uh, all of our, our biopharma listeners face and that is managing the heavy restrictions placed on a biopharma workforce uh, during the global health crisis. Um, before we jump into that, I wanna learn a little bit more about Dr. Watton. So you've been a pharma guy since, since your undergrad, since you know, way back when. Uh, I'm curious as to why and, and where the roots of your, your interest in science and your profession are planted. So, I um, really liked chemistry as a subject when I was at school and um, at the time I was uh, looking to do a degree, I chose to actually pursue a pharmacy degree because um, way back in the 80s when Margaret Thatcher was running the UK, um, you wanted to actually do a career um, after your degree where there was almost a guaranteed job at the end of it because of life was a bit uncertain then. Sure. And so I, um, I went and did pharmacy with the intent, though, of going on and doing a PhD and eventually getting into the uh, pharmaceutical industry. So I did a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences at Nottingham University, and um, it was a combination of chemical engineering and membrane transport. And um, then I went to work for Merck, which is my first job, which is a great place to work as a first job. Got trained in a lot of aspects of drug development, then got a headhunter call to go and look at Abbott, and I joined Abbott, where I was more in a managerial role, mm -hmm. involved in um, a number of interesting projects, developing uh, new drug products, but actually going to the problem solving uh, comment you made earlier, I was asked to head up a task force to commission a sterile production area, which is something I've not had much experience with, I must admit, but uh, at the end of about a 12 month stint, I knew everything you needed to know about doing that sort of work right. and um, that was a really enjoyable uh, project to take on and from there I actually really enjoyed working with people and interacting with people and I got uh, a call from a guy who was looking for somebody to go into um, basically sales and marketing business to business in, in England at the time and that led me to Penn West which uh, led me to move to the US in 1993 full-time and I've been working here ever since um, basically with uh, NASDAQ listed companies or similar size companies now and uh, focusing very much on uh, building strategy and then executing against that strategy and most of my career has been spent um, on transaction work as well as strategic planning so that's what I, I like to do and yeah. um, I think the most important thing, though, is to make sure that whichever job I'm doing, I'm working with a group of people that really are a pleasure to work with and are as committed to getting things done as, uh, as I am. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, some interesting kind of shifts in your, in your career coming from such a heavy science background and now being, uh, you know, involved in the managerial aspect and, uh, and leadership aspect. Um, 
what what's kept you motivated to to stay in it for for the long haul? It's been you know been a been a long road. Yeah, it has. I think uh, probably one word: curiosity. Um, I really, I'm a very curious person by nature, and um, I'm always looking for something else to do in terms of learning experiences. And I have quite a um, a low boredom threshold, I would say. <laughs> so um, I, I like to find something new to do. I like interacting with new people. Um, but I also like making sure that if there is an idea that um, has come across my desk, that I put ourselves in a position to be able to finish it off and have that plan all the way through to the end. So it's also about being um, pretty disciplined and following your plan um, to the end goal. And what I like about that is that if you lay out a plan in sort of like this year, you anticipate what you might be doing in five years' time, but you're going to have to demonstrate a lot of um, Darwinian behavior to get to the end goal because things change all the time. And being able sure. to um, is, is something I think, I think is quite important. Yeah. So, uh, that's yeah. what drives me. Well, you couldn't have teed up that segue any better, you know, talking about the fact that you can make a five-year plan, but, uh, you know, D Darwin may come in and, uh, you know, what's, what's the famous Mike Tyson quote where he says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face? <laughs> yeah. That's true, yeah. It's true, and, and COVID-19 uh, served up quite the punch in the face uh, for all of us. So I, I, I do want to talk, I want to spend some time uh, talking about Obsidian's therapeutic approach, but first I want to talk about, uh, you know, solving that problem that is, the uh, giant operational disruption that COVID caused uh, for all sorts of businesses, biotech included. So, um, and, and you've done some very specific things, very specific and interesting things there. We'll get into that, but I, I, I'm curious as, as the leader at Obsidian, you know, as, as the guy who's res responsible, everything rolls up. Uh, what, what was your initial reaction, emotional or, or otherwise? I, I, I'd like to hear both sides, the emotional reaction and the level-headed, we're going to get through this reaction, when you really absorb just how disruptive this pandemic was going to be uh, to your business? Well, the story started with us um, probably towards the middle of February. And uh, one of the people that works with me, Catherine, is an MD, and she also happens to be an epidemiologist. And I saw the reports coming out in about COVID. And... Um, one of the benefits of having someone like Catherine working alongside you is she's able to put everything into perspective. And um, her view at the time was it was going to be a serious pandemic. And um, we already had started looking at what we were going to do in the event we had to slow things down, how we're we going to prioritize and triage our, our work. And for me, um, there wasn't really much of an emotional uh, aspect to that for myself. There yeah. were other people in the office but not me um, but I was confident that I had a team within Obsidian that was capable of working their way through um, any situation because we assembled a new team at the top of the company over the past 12 months and they're all very capable people so they went away and came up with a plan triage the experiments and within three weeks of actually identifying this issue, we had people um, all the way throughout the organization planning for working from home. And we also had people in the organization who were ordering Purell by the gallon. <laughs> and we had that already in place uh, before the end of February. And um, in actual fact, today was the first day I went back to the office since we left the week of March the 9th. Yes, um, welcome, welcome back to the office. Yeah, so it was actually interesting to go back but um, once we decided to work from home, one of the commitments we had was we had a program which we're working with BMS on. Mm -hmm. And we got halfway through a set of experiments that were very critical for the success of that program. And what we were able to do was to have a, a skeleton team going into the labs just to work on that project. But we made a very conscious decision to keep the labs open. Yeah. And what happened then was that we worked out um, that people were very nervous about coming into the office. So we had to make sure that people understood it was safe. And we then went to a period where we wanted to get back working more broadly than just this single project. Um, and 
one of our guys came to us, who's an IT guy, Nick Betts, who we just hired in um, the back end of last year. And Nick had put into place teams for us in December and January, and um, had also worked on putting us uh, intranet up for the company as well. And everyone was booking their time in the office on Outlook, on an Outlook calendar. And Nick came right. up to me and said, this isn't going to work. So he said, leave this with me and I'll sort something out. And so he came back with what eventually became what we call Swift, which is the safe workplace function tool, where he took uh, approaches that he knew about and had, um, was able to devise a system where people could actually log in and uh, commandeer a piece of equipment for say three hours. And then once you knew where they were going to be, um, he could, uh, keep other people away from them by having them allocate space elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, it wasn't just a question of doing the software. It was basically getting a bunch of people together and walking through experiments that you might do in our labs and looking at the workflow and where people needed things like workstations, um, supply stations and things like that. And so we, we set up this Swift um, system and pretty soon everyone that was able to go into the lab was using the lab, uh, using the SWIFT system to set up their, um, their schedules. And it worked really, really well. Now in combination of that, we also set up a COVID-19 task force, which at the start of the um, period was actually meeting on a daily basis. I used to go into every meeting on every day. Now I don't attend those meetings because um, we got into a, a routine now, but Actually, putting that group, um, working on it was really important. So we had positions in there, a facilities manager, Nick, who was running the, um, the Swift software. And um, it all just came together. And I think at the end of the day, one thing that we've done really well is communicate. And the importance of communication in this uh, environment can't be overestimated. And um, I'm, I'm really pleased to say that we actually met our goals. So... We met our goal for BMS, which, I'm, which is a really big milestone for us as a company. Yeah. Um, and we did it in some style. And uh, as, as a result of that work, we also um, took that same package and we, in the spirit of the time, offered it to other companies as well to start working on. And we actually do have more than 30 parties now looking at this software. Um, one company in town, Magenta, already uses a version of it, which they customize for themselves. And uh, our partner BMS is also looking at it quite seriously too. So what a small company has done in Cambridge can now be scaled up elsewhere. Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, you know, just, just to be clear, we have a, a, a biotech that developed, uh, a, you know, sort of a emergency quick scale up uh, software application to manage its way through the limitations uh, of, of this pandemic, the limitations that the pandemic set on, on our workforces. Um, mm -hmm. So let, let's dig into that a little bit. I, I you know, um, I, I know that there's more depth to the tool than simply uh, space or, or uh, workspace allocation or planning. Um, what, you know, beyond proximity, what other specific sort of pandemic induced workplace problems does SWIFT set out to solve? Well, the other benefit of actually being able to track people is you can also trace them. So you can actually find out where they've been and who they've been in contact with. Mm -hmm. And um, thank goodness we haven't had a, an infection case in our organization. But uh, if there had been one, we would have been able to quickly identify people that have been in contact with them. I think the other thing that this brought us as well at the time when things are a little bit random, was just a much better planning ability for everybody to think through why they're doing experiments and focusing on doing the necessary things rather than the nice things. And just being able to have that focus, I think made us quite productive during that period. Yeah. And um, I think it was also good for people like myself. So I actually did go into the office one day, um, quite soon after we sent everybody home and I was asked to leave because <laughs> they'd seen me walking around um, and I'd actually just gone in to pick up some, some stuff. But uh, I did leave the office because it was the right call to make. And at that point in time, 
none of us really knew what we were dealing with. But uh, what's happened is that people have got into the, uh, the facility, they gain confidence as a result of doing that. We made life really easy for everybody. We didn't force them to take public transport. We offered to rent cars for people if they needed to rent cars, and they did. We, all of the allocated parking spaces in our building, we took away from senior management and just made them available to everyone so people could drive their own vehicles in. And mm -hmm. we've got a very clean working environment now. And I saw it for myself today. The office has changed. Yeah, um, there's a procedure to go in where your temperature is measured and things like that. But um, it's becoming the norm, and I think we've actually got very used to working like this quite quickly. The business of biotech is committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Cytiva formerly GE Healthcare Life Sciences and the gracious supporter of this project, is also committed to that cause. Check out Cytiva's resources for emerging biotech at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. And these, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, your, you know, your your uh, your temperatures taken. The, the, these are also in these actions are integrated in the in the Swift platform, isn't that right? Isn't there sort of sort of some sort of a fitfulness to work that day application? Yep. Um, uh, some management of of their of their fitfulness to work. Yes, I had to like for example myself this morning before I was allowed into the facility, I had to log in and answer a questionnaire about whether I'd come into contact with anyone in the past 14 days, did I exhibit any symptoms? It's the same sort of screening that Mass General would use for patients going into their own facility. And every day we ask people who are going in to fill out that questionnaire. Yeah, uh, also management of cleaning protocols, correct? Yeah, so we have, um, we have a deep clean of the office on a regular basis. Everybody has a Purell tub on their desktop. Um, we all wear masks in the facilities. There are a lot of open spaces in terms of desks, but in our area of the office, for example, where we used to have 15, 16 people, we now only allow six because that's necessary to have the social distancing. Mm -hmm. And um, things like practical things like the kitchen, you can only have one person really in the kitchen at one time. Otherwise you do get uh, potential for uh, cross-contamination. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and those reminders or checklists are built into the software application as well, to a degree? To a degree, yes. Yeah. yeah. We're actually rolling out version two now. So, yeah. so um, this, is, this is going to be even better because now it's web-based, so everyone can have access to it. And actually, if you think about it, there's uh, no reason why you couldn't use the same principles in terms of managing the workflow in a restaurant, making sure that you could allocate your tables the right way when you're taking your bookings in. But sure. we're focused on biotech, so we haven't got that far yet. For now, yeah, your, your next entrepreneurial venture. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about this as, as the leader of the company. I mean, obviously the, the, culture, uh, the culture there is, I would say, marked by intellect, of course. I mean, these are smart people who are aware of the medical danger, the you know, personal uh, health danger that this pandemic presents. Uh, but at the same time, Anytime you implement a new system, whether it's in response to a global health crisis or otherwise, uh, you, there's a little bit of change to manage, right? There's adoption, mm -hmm. potentially adoption issues. Uh, tell us a little bit about that story. How did uh, the change management exercise go? How well was the tool embraced? It's a, that's a really good question and an important aspect of trying to implement any, any change. I think it was helped by the fact we had to start off small I run a sort of beta test in our own facility and um, people got comfortable with that. And once people started seeing other folk going into work, they all felt um, motivated, I think, to go in and, and be part of that crowd that was um, actually showing success with the delivery of that BMS program that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, but I think the communication aspect of it's really important. The other thing I think is really Key, and I think in general, this is the way we should be managing organizations like Obsidian, 
is we spend a lot of time identifying the right people to come into our organization. And when you get the right people in, you then have to just trust them to do their job. And um, my style is very much delegation. If someone's identified a direction they want to go in, I generally don't stand in their way. I just let them go off and do it. In fact, I tell people I'd rather you come to me and have me say, no, you can't do that rather than coming to me and asking what I should be doing next. And mm -hmm. um, I think that we just want those proactive folk. And Nick was a good example there, but it's not just Nick. It's all the people that work with him on this. They all came up with ideas that were creative and channeling that creativity, I think is really important. And the other thing that um, I think this showed me was that we've got to be innovative as an organization just to succeed in biotech. But this took it one step beyond where the level of innovation in terms of our operations was also quite challenging, but they still came up with a, with a good solution. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I spent some time uh, covering uh, the, the IT space, the software space, and I know that there's, there's no shortage of workforce management applications out there for multiple verticals and industries. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I'm not that close to that space anymore, but I, I would venture a guess that none of them have been agile enough to, uh, implement modules or, or elements of their tools that speak specifically to this ever, you know, un, ever unfolding pandemic. So uh, kudos to you guys for taking that, taking that on internally and making it happen. Um, and, and even bigger kudos, you know, for putting it out there as an open source tool for, you know, uh, other, other biopharmas to use, you know, Nick, nice job, but next time try to monetize it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that one of the things that I can say about the Boston uh, area, though, so I was also part of a a regular call uh, with the CEO of some various companies that uh, Jody had set up from uh, Caven, and um, we were getting on call every Monday morning to talk about how we could collaborate to share experiences on uh, COVID nineteen and being able to manage our way through that. So. That was an important component of um, that decision to share it with everybody because we're all in the same boat. Yeah. And a lot of the biotechs in, in Boston are a similar size to Obsidian. They're 50 to 100 people. They're not large companies. And we have to do things rapidly and um, well in order to be able to survive in this, uh, in this business environment we operate in. And just being able to share that I think is really, really important. So a lot of people are sharing experiences and um, it's gone beyond just the experiences now. So there's a combined effort to put in a testing uh, team for everybody that's working in biotech in Boston. And um, this was initially coordinated through Atlas Venture, which is the group that uh, is our Series A uh, lead and investor. And so um, that brought together a group of people right from the start, but it went from 40 or 50 folk to start with to over 200 people attending these calls on a Monday. And everybody's been trying to collaborate and, and help each other out. So that was part of the decision. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other part of the decision, which is interesting now, is that we've been able to help organizations that aren't industry-based organizations, but um, medical centers. So we've actually been um, dealing with a couple of inquiries from medical centers that we are in touch with who also have now have the same issue about getting back to work safely yeah. and um, we've been able to share the software with them too and it got to a point actually matt where we were so busy just dealing with inquiries coming from other folk that we have now worked with a local provider of it uh, solutions to roll this out to to other groups and um I must say we did we did trade access to the software uh, for their services, so <laughs> part of the deal. So we did get some value out of it. But well, yeah, that's uh, that is a good deal. Uh, allow you to get back to your uh, your core competency. Yeah. Maybe challenge that IT group to uh, to develop the next great therapeutic for COVID nineteen. See how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Swap roles. Um, you know, when I think about where we are with it, with this uh, pandemic, it's it's clear. It's increasingly clear. I think every day that we're playing the long game. That this isn't going to be a. You know, there's not going to be a a, a swift. Uh, that was a bad word choice. 
uh, given the name of your software, there won't be a quick resolution. Uh, so this is more than a Band-Aid. The solution that you built is more than a Band-Aid. And I anticipate, I think you anticipate mm -hmm. that you'll, uh, you'll squeeze value out of it long term. But even after um, we've returned to some semblance of normalcy in, in operations, what have you learned or improved or, or sharpened as a result of the implementation of SWIFT that will carry on in your organization you know, well into the future, regardless of what normal looks like? That's a really good question. I think the, the aspect which has really improved amongst everybody in the organization has been planning mm -hmm. and then focus, focusing on the essential things to do. And I think it's made us more disciplined in, in the way we approach problems. So we're not, we're not wasting time on things that don't really add much value to projects. Um, we're actually really focused on getting stuff done and getting it done efficiently. And I think the other part of this, which you have to, have to remember that an organization like Obsidian starts out because it's got a bunch of really creative people uh, working on science. And at some point you have to transition to taking an aspect of that science and then putting it into development with the view to uh, dosing patients with it. And I think one of the things this has helped us to do is bring that planning discipline into an organization. Um, in some respects, COVID has been a bit of a change agent for us too. Yeah. And that's one aspect which I think has really been positive for us as a company. And it's also brought a sense of togetherness to the organization as well. And everyone, we always had a very collaborative culture at uh, Obsidian. But it's even it's got even better now. And um, you know, I just went in there this morning and I'm seeing people going about their sort of daily functions in the lab. They're all wearing masks, but everyone actually looked happy to be there. And mm -hmm. I was actually really happy to go back. It was nice to go back to work after nearly four months away. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, uh, I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a bit about your platform and, and maybe we can do that in the context of uh, you know, the, the conversation at hand, COVID-19, what it's done to the business, what, how you've reacted. Tell me about where CytoDrive, the CytoDrive, well, first, tell us about the CytoDrive platform. Then tell us where it was, you know, five months ago and, uh, and, and, and how you've been able to maintain progress to date. Sure. So the, the company was founded on technology that was developed at Stanford University by a guy called Tom Wanless. And... What we're able to do is to control both cell therapy and also gene therapy in terms of being able to express protein. So what we can do now is control the onset of action of proteins, but also the level of activity that those proteins can, um, can exert. So, and we've been able to do this through using a small molecule to trigger release of proteins and regulate the activity of those proteins. So it's the first time that any platform has been available that uh, effectively gives cell and gene therapy control now to the physician. Mm -hmm. um, up until now, that was really the missing link in both cell or gene therapies where if you give a cell therapy dose to a patient um, and get one result, but you might get a slightly different result in another patient and a very different result in a third patient. And partly that's because you can't control it. And that's one of the things that we can bring to the table now. And we're using a very well-established drug. It's not the only drug we can work with, but it's a 50, 60 year old drug called acetazolamide, which is actually used now for altitude sickness amongst skiers and people like that. Hmm. Um, it's a very old diuretic with a great safety record. And we've been able to now make that drug work in terms of controlling numerous cytokines, um, transcription factors. And I think we're the only company that can not just turn things on and off, but also move the levels up and down as well. So it's the first time you've been able to create this level of control. And that's been the missing link in cell therapeutics for a long, long time. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, where, where are you on the development uh, timeline? So we, um, we're actually focusing on oncology as our primary area. Now we can actually use this technology in 
and other areas where you'd need to manufacture protein, even things like antibody production, for example. But um, we are still preclinical. Um, we initiated development programs about nine months ago for our own pipeline efforts. And then uh, the, the most advanced program is one of the BMS programs, which I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, we anticipate going into MAN with our own program probably sometime in the second half of 2022. Okay. We've mapped out the development pathway. And um, since we have the development team put together, we've now had an interaction with the FDA and we've also had an interaction with the uh, equivalent in the UK to help us formulate our development pathway uh, as quickly as possible um, in order to make sure that we can get into man effectively. So we're going after oncology-based uh, disease. So you know, we're looking at things like solid tumors as well as liquid tumors. And um, it's something which I think is really, really important. I think one of the things that people don't realize is that um, if you've seen someone go through chemotherapy, it's a horrible thing for someone to go through. Mm -hmm. And cell therapy, when it works, really, really works well. Um, if we could make that more reproducible and actually make it more accessible, um, that should eventually become the primary treatment for, for cancer. Um, I don't know how long that's going to take, though, but um, we're all driven on this mission to make that happen sooner rather than, than later. So that's what it's all about at Obsidian. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a that's an excellent mission, and uh, you know, uh, all kidding aside, if if things didn't work out, you've always got the software business to fall back on. Well, that's now now, that's, now that you're a software development that, company. <laughs> yeah, now we're a software development company. It's been, um, I would. It's yeah. actually been really. It's important though because we we did that because it's a means to an end for us, which is actually funny enough with the patient in mind. It's trying to get there sooner Absolutely. rather than. It was all about efficiency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly. I mean, that's uh, and and it's it's uh, it's such an interesting story because it's unexpected. Um, and I give you I give your company a lot of credit, and, and I give Nick a lot of credit for inspiring the idea. Uh, I don't yes. know I don't know Nick by the way. I just I, I like his story. <laughs> it's, it's a good story. He was actually one of those. So he's also um, originally from the UK. And uh, we bonded pretty early on during our uh, interview within about 30 or 40 seconds when we both found out we were Liverpool yeah. supporters. And we just won the Premier League, so we're both very happy. At that. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's happy times in the Obsidian Lab. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so what, what's, what's next? Well, we kind of, kind of covered what's next for Obsidian. I, I guess I'd ask you, uh, as we kind of near our, our, our end time here, we're running, running short on time, uh, as it relates to solving your way through a problem as, as epic as the one that we're, you know, in the throes of right now, what, what advice do you give to the leaders of new and emerging biopharmas? Perhaps you're giving advice to a first time CEO at a, at an early stage biopharma um, who's in the throes of the same challenge or another. Uh, what, what's your best advice for that person? I think the best advice I can give anyone who is, building a team in biotech is build it from the top down and get really highly experienced people in your key positions as quickly as you can. Mm. Because to me, that made the difference on, on this exercise. I had people that just knew what to do without having to check back with me. And um, knowing that you've got people that you can absolutely trust means that everyone can focus on specific areas and do a great job there. And um, the other thing I think that I would say is, whilst you've got to hire people from the top down, you've also got to hire a group of people that get on with each other and quite frankly, can have it out with each other um, and make sure that we develop the best approach because that sense of honesty is something that's so essential when you're dealing with an issue like this. Yeah, yeah, very sound advice. Uh, I'm sure that the, the have it out with each other part uh, can create challenges for you as the leader of the company, but in a way it's constructive and healthy. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Well, Dr. Watton, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. It's a very interesting story. I wish you, uh, I wish you well. I thank you on behalf of uh, the, the greater life sciences community for your contributions uh, via the SWIFT platform. 
and the contributions you're making uh, toward cell and gene therapy. Man, uh, thanks very much. It's nice to meet you virtually, and hopefully one day, one day we'll meet in person. Yeah, I hope we I hope we get back to that day really soon. Thank you, Dr. Watton. Me so, too. so that's Dr. Watton. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the business of biotech, produced by Bioprocess Online and graciously sponsored by Cytiva. Access more resources for emerging biotechs at CytivaLifeSciences.com backslash emerging biotech. In the meantime, subscribe to this podcast. Give us five stars. Subscribe to our newsletter at bioprocessonline.com. And thanks for listening.